my name is uh, Sao Fong Ao, and uh, I am the director of the Wound Center. And um, so welcome for the um, for this panel, great panel. And it's really hard for me to sit here to introduce my panelists because they are all my great friends. And, um, but um, I'm the director of Women's Center and I just want to give a shout out for all the students up front in the Women's Center. If you guys can make some noise, let uh, two speaker know that. <laughs> <laughs> so Kinder, your student is there. So today um, I am honored to have a few of my dearest colleagues on campus and um, to cover a topic that I think is near and dear to many of us. Um, without too much explanation, everyone recall the day the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Ray, a right that many of us belief that we born with and die with. And um, today's panel will actually put this conversation in a historical context, how the Supreme Court had represented the history of reproductive rights in this country and what actually the history had told us and learning from the history Envision the life of women moving forward. And this event is co sponsored by a lot of uh, colleagues on campus, including the history department. I think that a lot of history folks are in the Women Center. I can tell that they actually seldom come here. And um, <laughs> so that's great. And also the Wolf Institute the Women and Gender Studies Program, the health clinics, among many others could put in the word, but without putting out their names. And uh, I'm going to briefly introduce a free speaker. You guys, uh, I think that a lot of you guys have access to Instagram. On a single time, I would encourage you to follow the Institute, the Instagram and Wolf Institute, or the Women's Centers Instagram. We are in a serious competition between Wolf Institute and Women's Center, who by the end of the year get their largest number of followers. So far, the Women's Center is way ahead of the Wolf Institute. But that being said, don't vote for the underdog. Always go for Women's Center. And uh, so I want to make sure that you guys follow that so that you can actually see the um, bio of our speaker. The three speaker that we have, the first one, and uh, many of you know, is uh, Professor Gunja uh, Sengutta. She's a history professor at Brooklyn College and also the Graduate Center with an interest in US woman history, slavery, and freedom in Atlantic and Indian Ocean worlds, uh, US Civil War and Black Atlantic history, and that uh, she has um, published extensively on the topic. And the second one is uh, um, Professor Amrata, Amrata Bonnie Anderson. And um, uh, Professor Anderson is very important to me. The reason why I'm here, because she's on the search committee and she hired me. So you're showing up, make sure that she did not, she doesn't need to regret her decision. Not at all. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Anderson is a pioneer of the field of women's studies and actually his, his study of women and uh, in history. And uh, she taught at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center for over 30 years. And she has published many books. And uh, the most recent one is the rabbi's atheist daughter, Ernestine Rose. And uh, she lectured widely on women's movement in international, international feminism and history of sexuality. Uh, for some of you may not know, Professor Anderson also also a very vivid blogger, and I'm going to put a link on the chat for you. So please follow her. And think of a lot of reason for her to regret why she left Brooklyn College. <laughs> And uh, the last person is not here yet, and uh, but she is uh, coming uh, 
on the Zoom soon, and uh, that is Professor Antonio and uh, she, uh, she is the chair, and also uh, the professor and anthropology. And uh, she has speaks and write about women's healthcare, social change, and resistance to neoliberalism. And uh, she also have actually take an active role and study abroad in the in Brooklyn College and net students on various projects and uh, invest in public health in um, rural India. So uh, forgive me if it is not the best uh, intro and. Um, Anyhow, and because the Professor Sengupta has an untimely incident, and uh, so she planned ahead of time before she is totally medicated by <laughs> necessary drugs, and uh, she had taped her uh, uh, lecture for us. So today we are going to have Professor Sengupta's for, go first, and then Professor Anderson and lastly Professor Anton Liello. I also would suggest that too and uh, each speaker will speak about 15 minutes and i will really encourage you to use the chat function function for you guys being the absolute gen c and um so if you like what you hear please show some emotions and reaction and uh, i think that a lot of us who are from the older generation will really appreciate your enthusiasm and if you have questions hold the question and i will also encourage you write it on the um on the chat so that we can go over it later. For people who are live streaming the event with us, and you can actually uh, talk to one of my staff who's sitting right next to the computer and she will type the question for you. Okay, without any further ado, uh, delay, Professor Sankupta. Uh, Salvan, I'll uh, share my screen. Bear with me for a moment, everyone, and I will play Professor Sengupta's video. So let's get that started. Bear with me. You can definitely show how anxious you are as the Professor Rami trying to figure out the video. <laughs> I can get it here. Yeah, give him some support. <laughs> <laughs> you got this, Professor. Uh, <laughs> okay, can everybody see that? Am I shared? It's, black. it's a black screen. Well, I'll start it, but. Hello, everyone. Yes. A big thank you to our sponsors for organizing this very timely event and to the Women's Center for hosting it. And a hearty welcome to our students and our audience members. Let me start by sharing with you that on a fateful day in June this year, I was chomping away on an egg salad sandwich when I heard the news. The US Supreme Court had decided in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, that the Constitution does not confer the right to abortion. And in so doing, as we know, they took away a woman's right to make her own health care decisions in consultation with her doctors, a right that had been established nearly 50 years ago in the case of Roe versus Wade. And in that moment, I remember thinking that a close family member of mine who had had an abortion in the 1970s for health reasons was in this respect a freer woman in 20th century India than a young woman is in 21st century Indiana. Now we know that judges deliver decisions that have an immediate and profound impact on our lives, determining such things as whether we can exercise the right to vote or practice birth control or marry for love. These decisions are ostensibly based on the judge's reading of the Constitution. Um, and when making them, judges often draw upon history, right, in order to understand the context of particular laws and the intent of their framers. 
Now, how many times do you think the Supreme Court invoked history to justify its decision in the Dobbs case? 67 times. The court claimed that, quote, an unbroken tradition of prohibiting abortion on pain of criminal punishment persisted from the earliest days of the common law until 1973, unquote. Historians were outraged because this is not true. Our professional organizations had, in fact, submitted a brief setting forth the correct history of abortion regulation, which the court had chosen to um, ignore. So let me start sharing a screen with you so that you can read uh, what the historians had to say in response. Uh, this is the response of the American Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians. Um, so let us set the historical record straight here. Um, I'm going to start by examining the pro-life argument that abortion was criminalized from the earliest days of the common law in order to protect unborn babies because life begins at conception. History actually teaches us that this was not the case. Rather, attempts to control reproduction were never about protecting life for its own sake, but rather about the shifting, changing politics of gender, race, class, and sex. As the political scientist Rosalind Bicheski has argued, abortion battles represent larger ideological contests over the meanings of family, state, motherhood, and women's sexuality. Until the middle of the 19th century, Americans did not make a distinction between abortion and miscarriage until quickening. And what was quickening? This was when pregnant women could feel their fetuses move, usually in the fourth month of pregnancy. Traditional English common law, which governed abortion, did not ascribe to the fetus a separate life until the mother could feel it move. So it was the woman who was in control. Now, home medical literature of the period offered women information about substances that they could take in order to regulate their menstrual flow, which in effect induced abortion. Uh, this included bloodletting, bathing, iron and quinine concoctions, and as a last resort, a deadly purgative mixed with warm water. In addition, midwives and herbal healers provided information about abortion. Madame Restel was a well-known provider. She advertised her practice in Greenwich Street and had traveling salespeople selling her female monthly pills. Uh, a New York guidebook dubbed her the wickedest woman in New York. Uh, but the point is, family doctors were also performing abortions for respectable women. So even after quickening, a fetus was not regarded as a person, nor was abortion criminalized. But this situation changed in the last uh, quarter of the 19th century, so that by the early 20th century, abortion was a felony. Now, why did this happen? According to historians like James Moore and Leslie Reagan, several developments converged to bring about the criminalization of abortion. Uh, for one thing, the American Medical Association was trying to set itself apart from non-professionals, including midwives and practitioners of homeopathy. It was seeking to eliminate competition from non-formal providers of abortion. But the medical crusade to criminalize abortion coincided with very important demographic shifts and cultural anxieties over gender norms. Now, who was getting these abortions? Before 1840, they were likely to be poor, young, unmarried women. But between 1840 and 1880, the proportion of upper or middle class white native born Protestant women seeking abortions soared. And at the same time, a flood of Irish immigrants and from the 1870s onwards, the so-called new immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were landing on US shores. Um, and this is 
fueling anxieties that the Catholic or Jewish rate of reproduction would swamp white Anglo-Saxon Protestant rates of reproduction. Equally sharp were anxieties over gender norms and expectations. The 19th century, as we know, saw the rise of an organized feminist movement. So women were spearheading crusades against slavery. They were campaigning for dress reform to get rid of corsets and uh, French heeled shoes. They were demanding an education. Some were even demanding the right to vote. Working class women were entering factories. They were going on strike. All of these transgressions fueled a patriarchal and nativist backlash. Let's take a look at uh, images from the 19th century and from the early 20th century, which uh, reflect some of these anxieties. So this slide um, shows a satire titled Women's Emancipation. It was published uh, in the British humor magazine Punch. It features an imaginary Bostonian by the name of Theodosia Eudoxia Bang, who is a blue stocking, which is to say an educated woman. And historians, of course, consider this to be inherently uh, comical. Or they point out that an educated woman is considered inherently comical. Um, uh, Theodosia is the principal of the Homeopathic and Thompsonian Institute. Now, homeopathy, as you know, is an alternative form of medicine, which was becoming popular in the middle of the 19th century. And Thompsonian uh, refers to George Thompson, who was a popular writer of uh, racy novels, including Venus in Boston, which portrays lesbian sex. So Theodosia Bang then is a symbol of everything that anti-feminists were mocking, right? wearing bloomers, educated, practices homeopathic medicine, uh, possibly a lesbian. Uh, then in 1873, a Boston physician named Edward Clark published Sex and Education, which predicted dire things for women who engaged in mental activity. If they engaged in mental activity, blood would drain from their nervous system and their reproductive organs, they would go mad, they would go infertile, they might even die. College, in other words, would produce invalids who would never marry, who would never produce healthy children, while immigrant women were producing healthy hordes of undesirable races. Then take a look at this anti-suffrage cartoon from 1909. This mirrors fears that when women step out of the domestic sphere and start voting, gender roles will be reversed. Men will be cowering, uh, taking care of kids. The house will be in a mess with the pot boiling over uh, in the kitchen. Uh, feminism, in other words, raises the specter of you know, women with beards and men in petticoats. Now, these images give you a sense of the patriarchal backlash against the threat of social change, but they also establish for us a context for understanding the argument that historians like Leslie Reagan were making. Male physicians were trying to keep women from entering medical school. They were asserting their moral superiority over uh, uh, female abortion pr providers. And some of them were stoking a resurgence of the cult of true womanhood, in which feminine virtue was tied not only to motherhood, but also to the prevention of race suicide. So a leading figure in this regard was this Boston obstetrician called Horatio Storer. And he declared, quote, the true wife must never seek undue power in um, public life because women carried the future destiny of the nation in their loins because they alone could ensure that the US would be populated by native born whites rather than by, you know, uh, Mexicans and new immigrants and African Americans and so on. So in other words, you had a coalition of uh, certain doctors, certain lawmakers coming together to pass laws criminalizing abortion. 
Now, a landmark in this regard arrived in 1873 when a guy called Anthony Comstock, who headed this organization known as New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, spearheaded a law. And this law banned the sharing of information about birth control because such information was deemed immoral, obscene, on par with pornographic materials. Now, Margaret Sanger, the birth control uh, advocate, was actually jailed under this law. Now, in the long run, of course, contraception gained acceptance by winning the support of the medical community. Uh, the birth control league lobbied for laws that would give physicians alone the authority to prescribe contraception uh, to healthy women. But Sanger, as we know, resorted in the end to eugenicist arguments more children for the fit less for the unfit in 1825 birth control won the support of the american medical association but this last point brings us to the very different ways in which women on the margins of society experienced reproductive coercion how race, class, national origins shaped very different experiences of reproductive control. Forced reproduction was a central fact of slavery. Moreover, an enslaved mother had no right to her child under the chattel principle. But after slavery, states like North Carolina launched sterilization programs in the name of scientific eugenics. Professor Antonello will address this point in much greater detail. Uh, so let me just say that interracial feminist activists have proposed a framework of reproductive justice that acknowledges that intersections of race, class, sexuality, and so on produced different histories of reproductive coercion. In this context, some critics have noted that the Supreme Court's decision in Roe versus Wade focused on individualism by grounding abortion rights in the right to privacy rather than equality. Uh, the right to privacy had been established in the 1965 Griswold versus Connecticut decision in which the Supreme Court upheld the right of married couples to use contraceptives. And now this right to privacy was implied in the First Amendment guarantee of free speech, the Ninth Amendment's reference to certain rights, and the Fourteenth Amendment's guarantee of due process of law. Now, as Pachewski has observed, the right to personal ownership of one's body, its sexuality, and reproductive capacity is potentially transformative. Take the Supreme Court's uh, decision, for instance, in the Lawrence versus Texas case, um, in which it ruled against sodomy statutes upholding LGBTQ rights. But on the other hand, as scholars like Andrea Smith have pointed out, the privacy framework can also be interpreted in libertarian ways to mean freedom from government intervention rather than positive state action to guarantee equal access to reproductive health services. So as an alternative, a reproductive justice coalition uh, that originated with 12 African-American women who were attending this pro-choice conference in Chicago in 1994 connected the choice of motherhood with such issues as economics, um, immigration, incarceration. And this idea of re reproductive justice connects access to safe and legal abortion with a host of social justice issues. In the words of one of its scholars, reproductive justice says that in order to live safe and dignified lives, all women must have the right to decide whether to get pregnant and stay pregnant. If they decide to stay pregnant, they must have the right to adequate information and services and personal safety while pregnant. Every woman must have the right to be the parent of her child and to have access to the resources she needs to raise that child in a safe, healthy and life enhancing environment. She must have access to food security 
to a good education for her child, to safe streets, um, to um, health care. And so let me just end by suggesting that a holistic perspective that connects abortion rights with the broad based social justice agenda offers a framework for bringing us together, for building a coalition in a common struggle for a more just, equal, and free and fair society. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor um, Sankupta. And, um, and I am going to move on to Professor Anderson. And uh, please take the floor. OK, how do I do that? You can just go ahead and speak. OK. Um, well, uh, just as Professor Sangupta did, I'm going to put women first. Uh, when I was writing women's history, Back in the day, we decided to use phrases like women and men, wives and husbands, queens and kings. And the fact that those phrases are still not current, I think signals that we have a fair way to go. Now, I I'm old enough to remember having witnessed an illegal abortion. So I would like to describe that to you. A very close friend of mine named Enid, uh, got pregnant just after we graduated from college in 1965. So abortion was illegal. We were privileged. We were white, we were solidly middle class, and we lived in New York City, which meant we had a lot of contacts. We talked to everybody we knew and we found an MD for her, which was really good. He asked us to come to his office at five in the morning and he charged $900 for the procedure which the equivalent today is $7,300. <clears throat> we got there and he performed what was called a DNC, dilation and curettage, uh, dilating the opening of the uterus and then using a curette, which is shaped like a spoon with a sharp edge to pass over the surface of the, the womb to remove uh, any fertilized egg or fetus. He did this without anesthesia, which was never done. And my friend came out bleeding and screaming and fortunately was okay. Uh, she borrowed $300 from me. She had 300, the guy had 300. It took her years to pay it back. That was the best case when abortion was illegal. Most women didn't have those privileges and the Supreme Court never examined the worst cases. Um, women who would, uh, you know, use a coat hanger. Most young people don't know why the coat hanger is a symbol of the, you know, pro-abortion movement. It's because women would straighten out the bend of the hook of the coat hanger, shove it up themselves, hope to piercing, hoping to pierce their uterus so they could uh, deflect the pregnancy. Um, other people uh, tried to, went to quacks, attempted falls, uh, or took poison. By the 1940s, over 1,000 American women died each year from uh, illegal abortion. And hospitals created what were called septic abortion wards to reduce the number. By 1972, the last year when abortion was illegal in this country, 39 women died out of 130,000 who attempted to end, end their pregnancies. Outlawing abortion does not stop women from trying to abort pregnancies. It just makes it unsafe, dangerous, and sometimes fatal. None of these facts is mentioned or even alluded to by the Supreme Court, nor is the fact that 60% of Americans believe abortion should be legal, and 30% of anti-abortionists believe it should be legal in some instances like rape or incest. As a woman I like to follow, Heather Cox Richardson has often written, Turning the such legislation over to the states is exactly what the Confederacy tried to do. And if you turn it over to the states, you get the situations we've read about in recent months where a 10 year old is pregnant and can't get an abortion, where a 14 year old is asked by a doctor or told by a doctor she's not old enough to decide to get an abortion, but she is old enough to be a mother. You know, terrible situations. 
Instead, the Supreme Court asserted, quote, originalism, insisting that a topic must be in the Constitution to be upheld. I think this argument is ludicrous, and I am not alone in this. This is exactly what the American Historical Association and the Organization of American Historians, which Professor Sengupta alluded to, argued. Um, women are not mentioned in the Constitution. Do we not exist? Slavery did exist when the Constitution was written, and in fact, the so-called Great Compromise, which allowed slavery, um, never used the word because they were ashamed of it. They called slaves all other persons. Um, enough of the founding, the, the brilliance of the founding fathers, in my and others' opinion, was to acknowledge that they did not know what the future would bring. They put the power to amend in the Constitution, only limiting it to not creating a new monarchy. Article 9 of the Bill of Rights, which out which the Constitution would not have been ratified, states, quote, the enumerations in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. This seems pretty clear to me but not to the conservative justices who spent a great deal of time arguing that the right to privacy, the basis of Roe, is not mentioned in the Constitution. They also argued that what they were doing was not political. Now, because of the small view, you can't really see my earrings, but they're Ruth Bader Ginsburg's collars, and that's in honor of her, because as long as she was on the court, no one, you know, they, they, they had, she had the, ex, the, the fifth vote, uh, for not overturning a bill like Roe. But the new Supreme Court with three justices appointed by President Trump argued that they uh, argued against a, a, a very old legal principle called stare decisis. Uh, stare decisis literally means to stand by things decided. And it's that in, except in very extreme cases, a court should not rule against legal precedent. This court argued speciously that they were not overturning that doctrine, but quote, reinterpreting it. They compared their ruling to Brown v. Board of Education, which overturned the late 19th century ruling of Plessy v. Ferguson upholding segregation. But there are crucial differences in the two rulings. First, Brown was a unanimous court vote, nine to zero. Second, Brown expanded civil liberties while, while Dodd control, cont, excuse me, curtails them. In addition, since we're looking into historical truths, Justices Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett swore to uphold Roe in their senatorial hearings. Mentioning Barrett, I cannot help but think of Kate McKinnon's a uh, parody of her on Saturday Night Live. Uh, uh, Justice Barrett said that uh, if women didn't want to have children, they should give birth and then uh, give the babies up for adoption. And McKinnon said, uh, just pop them out and give them away. So these are the things the justices did not say. What did they say? Judge Alito cited Matthew Hale as an authority in his opinion. Hale was a 17th century English jurist who was considered a misogynist in his own day. He did argue against all abortions, although the word was not used then. And as Professor Sengupta said, uh, before quickening, you know, a mother could do anything she wanted. He also argued that women could be burned as witches and that mar marital rape did not exist. Some authority. Justice Thomas, in his decision, went even further. In his opinion, which argued that stare decisis did not exist in this case, he also argued that the court should rule against same-sex marriage and even against contraception. Uh, he did not rule against interracial marriage, which of course was also illegal in those days because he is a black man married to a white woman. What a hypocrite. Given the state of the Supreme Court, and remember that the justices voting to overturn Roe were nominated by presidents who did not win the popular vote. There are a number of remedies. First, and this seems extreme, enlarge the court. And here I wanna cite the example of FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
when he was president trying to implement the New Deal to solve the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Supreme Court kept voting down his measures. And he threatened to enlarge the court from nine to 13 justices. There is nothing in the constitution that says how many justices should sit on the Supreme Court. Uh, the threat worked. Uh, they caved once he had threatened to enlarge it. I'd like, I'm interested to see what should be happening today. And I've been signing many petitions to enlarge the court if necessary. Um, more importantly, the Supreme Court does not have final say in this nation. Congress does. Congress can pass laws overruling the court and has done so many times, most particularly in the post-Civil War era, right? Uh, but in order for this to happen, Democrats must win. So my final words to you are get out and vote. I'm encouraged by the fact that so many young, young women have registered to vote more than in any other period. And by the pro-abortion vote this summer in Kansas, which was not a blue state. So I'm going to end by saying, row, row, row the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anderson. And um, once again, student, if you have, or anyone on the Zoom, if you have questions, please write on the chat and then we will make sure that we got to answer it and I have, I'm sure that many of us are thinking about a lot of things at this moment with uh, the two insightful lecture by uh, Professor Sankupta and Professor Anderson. So last but not least and uh, I want to turn um, the floor for um, to Professor Antoniano. I just want to uh, share a series of fun fact. Professor, Professor Antoniano actually was the second longest serving women's center director in the history of Brooklyn College Women's Center. And now uh, when the center was close, really close to shut down, Professor decided to move her desk to the center and hug the space <laughs> and, uh, until I come on board. So um, it is one of the warrior on campus. Professor Antoniano. Um, can you make me co-host so I can show slides? Yes, certainly, I can do that. One, uh, one moment. Okay. Thank you, cell phone. Just bear with me, please. Well, I'm happy to be here. Not, the, not an historian on the panel. So I have a very different perspective. And I'm happy to see Gunja. How are you feeling, Gunja? <laughs> if one of you guys have time, when Professor Wami tried to set up the slideshow, you really should do a meme for Professor Sam Gupta, we lead an Asian superwoman. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> And uh, someone can take a picture of her arm. <laughs> I think the blue go really well with patients. Okay, um, I am co-host now. Okay, great. Okay. All right, one second. Okay, so um, Thank you uh, for inviting me, Steve, and um, following these two wonderful talks. Um, as I said, I'm not an historian. I'm an anthropologist who specializes in health, uh, sometimes called medical anthropology. And today I'm gonna to talk about reproductive abuse, especially sterilization, as part of this really bad history um, that we're talking about. Uh, but I will finish on a positive note uh, discussing social movements for um, reproductive justice that anthropologists are looking at. So um, I would like to um, also um, talk about the difference between population control and birth control um, by asking a question that I'm sure historians never ask, but this question is, um, how did the Spanish-American War affect reproductive rights and reproductive justice for women on the island of Puerto Rico? Probably never asked in a history class, however. Um, 
So um, I was hoping that I could see the faces of the history majors in the audience, but I'm sure you all know um, when um, this, this war um, ended in 1898 and that at um, the end of it, the United States acquired the island of Puerto Rico in the Caribbean and Guam and the Philippines in the South Pacific. And Puerto Rico became an unincorporated territory of the United States and the political economy of colonialization uh, began on this island. And that's the hint to the answer of this question. So I'm sure you've all heard of Banana Republic, right? I don't mean the overpriced clothing store. Um, I'm talking about um, the colonialization um, that happened at the turn of the um, um, 20, well, not the 20th century, but colonialization that affected Caribbean islands or Central America and turned those locations into monocropping economies in which the land is devoted to producing one crop for capitalist markets for the wealthy countries of the global north. In the early part of the 20th century, with capital investments from the United States, Puerto Rico um, became a major sugar producer. Uh, with most of the profits or almost all of the profits going to American companies. Um, and um, the land for creating the sugar monocropping or sugar republic was gained by displacing small farmers whose land and livelihood were forced and were lost their livelihoods and were forced to become workers in cane fields. Now harvesting sugar is a very labor intensive and, gen and dangerous manual process using machetes and bare hands. And um, I saw this not on the island of Puerto Rico, but in India where I, I do research. Um, consequently, um, for the farmers, uh, the displaced farmers of Puerto Rico, um, they became part of this coerced labor force working on these huge plantations, these two sugar plantations. And Puerto Rico became one of the principal producers of sugar internationally. But rather than making the island rich for Puerto Ricans, the process of colonial capitalism de-developed the island, leaving it without infrastructure and with landless men without a livelihood. So what does this have to do with um, reproductive justice? There's the flag, Spanish-American War. OK. Um, when the um, boom and bust capital markets of sugar produced on the island declined in the 1930s and 40s, the US colonial policy solution was to adopt an insidious policy that was becoming popular on the mainland and in Europe, blaming the problem of economic collapse on overpopulation. So the US protectorate instituted population control which is a neo-Malthusian ideology. Gunja and I, by chance, have the same slide. Um, that increased population is the root of poverty and underdevelopment. The policy furthered US companies' capital interests um, and the island itself um, descended into inequality. In, uh, um, in 1937, Puerto Rico enacted Law 116, a eugenic sterilization law passed under the United States territorial jurisdiction, which was not um, repealed until the 1960s. Eugenics is a strongly negative and misguided approach to population control policies, including forced sterilization and selective breeding programs. The word literally means good birth yet its historical connotation is tied to appalling policies instituted um, in the United States and Europe beginning in the 1930s. So in Puerto Rico, women were encouraged and in many instances coerced into sterilization. These sterilizations were performed by surgery. The operation or tubal ligation colloquially called having one's tube tied um, or to surg the surgical procedure, which is a hysterectomy, which is the complete removal of the uterus. It is estimated that between 1947 and 1948, 
7% of Puerto Rican women were sterilized. And by 1956, one out of three women suffered the same fate. In the 1950s, US policy um, to solve overpopulation um, instituted Operation Bootstrap that you may have heard of um, to move Puerto Rico away from its agrarian system and into an industrial economy by moving policies, uh, I'm sorry, for moving men and eventually families to New York City. In Puerto Rico, an economic solution was the introduction of the textile industry to the island um, and the main laborers for this industry were women. Women formerly living in agrarian towns moved to factory towns and were trained to be um, machine operators, as you see here. In the 1950s, it was no coincidence that sterilizations were encouraged by factory owners and in fact, sometimes key to getting a job. If a woman was, could prove that she was sterilized, she could get a, a permanent position. So how does this history explain um, reproductive rights? Um, anthropologists, such as Leith Mullings, have been analyzing reproductive rights since the 1990s from the perspective of racial discrimination, class exploitation, and gender subordination, more recently called intersectionality. Uh, today, I want to talk about two very important books that look at two aspects of reproductive freedom. One that helps explain the reproductive decisions made, for Puerto, made by Puerto Rican women by, um, by um, Iris Lopez. The title of the book, as you see here, is Matters of Choice, Puerto Rican Women's Struggle for Reproductive Freedom. She writes, empowering women of color, I'm sorry, empowering women of color, sorry, skipped a line. Um, okay. Um, anthropologists, study reproductive health and reproductive justice by using traditional methods of ethnography, which I'm sure many of you students have heard about. Um, the dominant technique uses methods of participant observation, which for most anthropologists takes at least one year of data collection at particular field sites to compile dissertations, monographs, or books. And most of us love um, that part of being an anthropologist. Iris Lopez, conducted research in Brooklyn, in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and in Puerto Rico. And she traces three generations of Puerto Rican women to explain reproductive freedom. The first generation were born on the island, while many of the second generation emigrated to New York City where their daughters were born. Lopez examines the complexity of reproductive decision-making and the residual of the abuses of sterilization on Puerto Rican women. While Iris documents the abuses and the disinformation that led some women to ultimately decide to be sterilized. And um, in the 1950s and 60s, the procedure was done using general, sur general surgery and full anesthesia, not like the less invasive laparoscopic surgery done today. In addition, in the 1950s and 60s, there were no modern types of contraception and a variety of uh, and the variety of choices that women have today, as you see here um, on this chart, um, that indicates the effectiveness and birth control um, methods. Um, and but as you see, I hope you can see um, down on the bottom row, there's um, the less effective method, and one of the methods there is called um, withdrawal or the pulling out method. Um, and this is my only um, reproductive joke. What do you call people who use withdrawal um, as birth control? Parents. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not very effective. And um, another question is, uh, as you see on the right, why is vasectomy a much, e a much easier and simpler procedure rarely performed? That's another another question. Um, but in, in the 1950s and 60s, there were no birth control pills or IUDs or Plan B. 
uh, just a major surgery in the form of tubal ligation or hysterectomy, and of course, condoms, which need to be used by men. So women on the island of Puerto Rico were doubly affected by the sterilization policy and the use of the island for large scale human trials of birth control pills, which were carried out in Puerto Rico in the 1950s with little or no informed consent that the pills they were taking were part of a pharmaceutical trial. So in, um, this is just um, an example of the variety of birth control we have today um, that again, may be taken away by um, the Supreme Court, which is a larger question. So um, in her ethnography, Iris Lopez documents the complexity of decision-making to explain why women chose sterilization at, because it was one of the only options available to them. She points out that birth control um, meets a woman's need to space births and prevent pregnancy, unlike sterilization that can be construed as population control, a governmental strategy to control the birth rate or population of a particular society. So Puerto Rican women in the, in the first generation of her um, analysis had large families, five to 10 children characterized by early marriage when an option to limit family size became available, many women saw it as a way to limit their family size. However, part of the disinformation of the sterilization um, surgical procedure was the colloquial use of the term tubes tied. Obviously, if something is being tied, it can be untied. However, the surgical method um, not only tied the fallopian tubes, but cut the fallopian tubes and in some cases burned the edges to prevent um, fertilization. And as you know, the fallopian tube um, is the site of fertilization and the procedure um, of tubal ligation interrupts the implantation of the fertilized egg into the uterus or womb. So the disinformation regarding having tubes tied was difficult to counteract because the presumption was that they could be untied. And, and this uh, misinformation still exists today. So to, um, to understand matters of limited reproductive choice, Iris Lopez analyzes other factors such as family relations, <laughs> marital strife, migration, housing, jobs, education, um, and especially migration from an agrarian society to the teeming urban environment of New York City. For example, in the 1960s, there were more Puerto Ricans living in Brooklyn than in San Juan. So Lopez assesses the social, political, and economic changes on women's gender awareness and reproductive choice with, the, with the, these limited options available to them. So because the study is both generational and longitudinal, Lopez is able to examine the historical forces that structured women's decisions and how the decisions of the first generation influenced their children and grandchildren, even when other options became available. The following ex excerpt is from the study, a woman with pseudonym Carmen, who was married at 19 in uh, 1981. She had six children and although um, tying her tubes was against her religious beliefs, she felt she had no alternative. So this is a quote from the text. I came to New York from Puerto Rico when I was, was um, 23 years old. Life was hard when I was growing up because I was the eldest of 10 children. I was always cooking, cleaning, and making them clothing. My mother advised me to get sterilized after my second child. Now with six um, and three days um, before the scheduled op operation, la operacion, a woman died on the operating table and my husband didn't let me do it. If I had gone against his will, he would have left me and I didn't want him to go. This is just uh, one example of the richness of Lopez's argument that analyzes the intersection of 
personal motivation, gender awareness, cultural influences, social structural constraints, and the historical experiences in order to understand what the center of her work, the agency and constraint of the lives of women um, living in New York. So how has colonialism affected Puerto, Re Puerto Rican uh, women? Um, um, I want to also ask um, a related question, which is, um, was sterilization a problem in, in New York City in the 1970s? Um, so this is a picture of Bellevue Hospital, which is not just a psychi psychiatric hospital. And in the 1970s, most of the patients who came to the OBGYN clinic were black and brown women from the projects on the Lower East Side. In an unparalleled example of medical malpractice, paternalism, and patriarchy, physicians themselves decided um, if women had too many children. They made these decisions um, by asking women when they were in um, the hospital labor room, if they wanted another child. Um, now, the physicians ob obviously had the his women's history in front of them. Um, now, anyone who has been in labor knows that um, when you're in labor, in the labor room, the last thing you wanna think about is having another child. However, the physicians used that moment to ask women to sign for the procedure that would happen before they left the hospital. In those days, women um, stayed in the hospital from four to six days after delivery. If a woman signed the next day, they would be scheduled for surgery. The most sinister part of these actions is that the type of surgery, whether tubal ligation or hysterectomy or type of hysterectomy, was based on the learning opportunities for medical interns. So, Physicians would make these decisions, get this so-called permission, and then make the decision about the type of surgery based on what they felt they needed to teach other doctors. So women would leave the hospital not knowing what had performed, been performed on their bodies. Um, and it was not the woman nor her husband, but the physician in those days, 90% of physicians were male, who made these most intimate and personal decisions. Now, the evidence of this abuse can be found in the 1979 law that was passed, which, which required a woman who was interested in a sterilization procedure to sign for the procedure 30 days before the surgical date. Okay, so um, aside from all of these negative um, aspects of this. I would like to talk about a very positive aspect of um, reproductive rights, which is um, the women's movement um, of organizing activism. Um, now, you all know um, that a stricter um, abortion law was defeated in the state of Kansas because of women's mobilization. And hopefully you've participated in protests against the Supreme Court decision. But uh, another anthropologist, uh, Patricia Zavea, um, has written a book called The Movement for Reproductive Justice, Empowering Women of Color Through Social Action. <laughs> and the purpose of, of um, this book is so that reproductive, um, reproductive advocates are well aware of the need to frame issues from the perspective of women of color as illustrated um, in the, in the epigraph, um, they are familiar with what she calls defective thinking um, yes. and influential views by political leaders and sco scholars um, that see social problems as originating from low income women themselves. So Zavea um, carefully um, dismantles what she calls this deficit thinking concept like uh, the uh, matriarchal Black families, urban underclass, and the culture of poverty, an unfortunate anthropological contribution to a negative and damaging concept about um, Puerto Rican women. 
But what Zveya um, tells us is that the meaning of, of resiliency to reproductive um, justice activists goes beyond people's ability to withstand and endure hardship and includes how they frame the challenge to incorporate women's creativity. Zavea emphasizes collaboration across difference and self-care to heal injustice. She consulted with more than 15 activist organizations, including Black Women for Wellness, California for Reproductive Justice, Forward Together in Oakland, California, Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health, uh, the National um, Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, the Latin Institute for Reproductive Health, and Tiwe Women United. Her emphasis, and what she writes about in, in the book, is taking a long-term approach to organizing and um, making clear that it takes time for activists to get to know each other and negotiate difference through storytelling, mindful collaborations, and um, public advocacy, always emphasizing uh, self-care. And this book documents how these organizations use self-care in various ways um, to support their activism and their fight for, um, for reproductive justice. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Antoniello. I know it's just amazed every time I listen to you guys talk, even though you already see it, I learn something new every time. And I think that we should consider bringing Zibala back to the campus and talk about the collaborations around yes. women and building community. And so um, we have about um, 10 minutes. And uh, so I've been scouting through the uh, chat and um, I wonder anyone has any questions? Questions? Anyone you don't agree or a challenge? Well, if there's I, no questions, then I would I, like to post them. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Just, go ahead. just uh, not a question. Just I want to thank everybody. This is so great to hear all this stuff. I'm going to drop a couple of resources uh in the chat for that our students might like to see um and and that's it other than i want to defend uh uh, uh samuel thompson who who was a a uh, wonderful provider of uh medicine for americans in the uh, 19th century and not a pornographer <laughs> uh, that was that was a that was a different thompson it was I don't know. He might have, he might have done some pornography on the side, but he's most famous for his uh, Thompsonian Thompsonian system of medicine, which was uh, carried out onto the prairies by American families who couldn't have uh, uh, access to to professional medical care. Uh, and he was a uh, an herbalist. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll drop some abortion related stuff in the chat. Um, you know, I have been questions, and then maybe. Um any one of you guys can respond to it and hope to spark some conversation. Um, obviously we're in New York City. New York City is a blue city. New York State is a blue state. The right to abortion, it is in our constitution. And, um, and um, so um, it is very really safe for us. And I think that Bonnie earlier corner phrase, uh, roll, roll, roll the boat. <laughs> and, and, I can safely assume that New York and New York's New York and state would be democratic leaning and actually governed by Democrats. So for people who like us who live in blue states, how do you articulate to students who feel that it doesn't matter where they vote or not because it is a blue state anyway, that even in a blue state like New York, voting, particularly under the backdrop of the overturn of vote versus way is essential. Can I answer that briefly? Um, this was part of my talk that I left off because I thought we were going to leave time for questions. Um, the most common method of abortion nowadays is medication. 
And is the Supreme Court going to rule that medication cannot be shipped across state boundaries? If so, that is a tremendous violation of not only free speech, but you know, everything. And I would, I would recommend to students that one major reason for voting is that so that we can send medication to people in other states. A second and related topic is the revival of the old Jane network. The Jane network uh, was women who helped women get abortions in other states when they, it was illegal in their own. And that has been revived, unfortunately or fortunately. So I think there are many reasons to vote. Go ahead. Unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah. Besides, um, you know, lawmakers like Lindsey Graham have been talking about federal laws, to, which, of course, would run completely counter to this idea of states' rights, right? Uh, so one of the reasons that you need to vote, especially at the national level, is that if the wrong people control the majority, um, federal laws may uh, on this subject may supersede state laws um, uh, in, in some way. So, so yeah, that's and, what I have to say. But also, um, I think it's uh, important not only for you to vote, but for you to talk to your friends and your family and people, especially who live in other states and encourage them to vote. I mean, the, um, I'm hearing now in the news that sort of the blip of um, women who uh, were motivated by uh, the abortion issue seems to have flattened out um, in terms of voting in the, uh, two weeks from now. So I think we all have to keep talking about this and keep talking to people um, and encouraging them to vote. And could I follow up if I if I may just I and I this question could be directed at all the panelists, but uh, Bonnie in particular, given that much of your scholarship has been uh, has dealt with the history of, of of activism, what advice would you have now for young activists in addition to the, the imperative to vote? Uh, but uh, but beyond that, especially in Pat too, given your uh, your both of your backgrounds and perspectives and scholarship and activism? I would say canvas. I mean, canvassing is really important. I canvassed for Obama in Pennsylvania. I'm not able to do it now because of my age, but young people can certainly go to non-blue states and go door to door. And that's a very effective strategy, particularly if you respect the other person you know, and say, how do you feel about this? And talk about feelings. And uh, it's very powerful. The other method that is less accept less uh, possible for young people is to donate money. And that's good for older and middle-aged people. Yeah, and I, I would say also um, joining um, organizations that are working on this. But I, I think um, it's important for people to have a community around them when they're um, when they're working on on these issues. So um, I know it's only three weeks away, but you can you can still uh, participate um, in group activities of people who are working working on these types of issues now. Ad, we have a, we have another two minutes. Any comments? <laughs> Anything from our students in the uh, the live audience there? No, no, you're not curious about. Uh... Yeah, I'm sure you have a question. <laughs> yeah, I, I also saw a lot of men out there too, and oh, uh, yeah. so I think that wrapping up, and I don't know whether it's I think it's appropriate. It's that <laughs> I think that abortion, in my experience, abortion is one of those things that you really don't think that you live it until you live it or your friends live. And obviously it's not something that, that a lot of a male student experience. And how can we articulate the importance of abortion rights to overturn a role versus way in men's life? That is a little bit less than 50% of population. 
in the US. One of my least favorite sayings is she got herself pregnant. Really? Well, you know, um, I'd like to point out that uh, really reproductive health services have to do with health right? It's, it's not just, it has to do with the welfare of families. It has to do with the welfare of children. Um, it has to, so everyone really has an interest. And I think a lot of our students don't remember what it was like before abortion was legal, which is why Bonnie's testimony was so powerful. Uh, a reminder of what might happen if we have to go back to those days, right? Women will die. Women we love around us will die. And that is what um, I live in terror of. You know, I don't want uh, the, the daughter of a friend of mine. I don't want a student of mine to go through what women before 1973 went through and and that's doesn't have to be just about you it has you know it can be about the communities and families around you my students did you sign in <laughs> <laughs> they, they are they, they are signing there are a couple other interesting questions in this in the interest of time and uh, i will share those questions with uh, professor uh, sangupta so that when she are they shy over? to ask okay you they can uh, email me <laughs> Yeah, they can email you and also they can they can wave and let you know they're not shy. I 100% sure they're not shy. And uh, <laughs> you can tell they're actually really engaged. And uh, and once again, thank you so much. And uh, I'm the, the Bunny, Pat, and Gunja. And uh, it is really my one of the favorite events so far this semester. And um, it is always good to see old friends, a student community in Portland, and I can attest to it without this big woman in my life, I cannot last at Brooklyn College for all this year. So um, goodbye and thank uh, you very bye. much. Love to you, Safong. Steve, thanks. Bonnie, Patrick, thank you. fantastic. <laughs> uh, all of you. Bye.